Philip Hand and I want to welcome you to Encounter TV today. Uh, I have a, a special guest on the show who's uh, an ex-Satanist, he's a man that was involved in witchcraft and uh, was a, a warlock and God dramatically got hold of him and turned his life around. He's now a revivalist, uh, an evangelist with powerful ministry uh, for setting people free from religion and uh, false doctrine and uh, I just want to really encourage you to uh, listen to today's show uh, and receive because God wants to talk to you uh, and he wants to speak to you through this program today I know that for sure if this is your first time watching you're very welcome um, we we, we want to hear from you so we encourage you to contact us at encountertv.org send us a message and tell us that where you're listening from and uh, how the programs are impacting you so Rob Rodasti is on the program um, it's good to have you on the show Rob and uh, we welcome you to England and uh, to the United Kingdom thanks We've for had, having me We've had, we've had a powerful weekend of ministry already. Today on the show, I want to talk about your life story, really, and how um, God set you free. You've written your own biography book here, yep. um, which is called And the Unleashed Me to the World, which is uh, a powerful title in itself, um, but that's because your testimony is powerful. Um, just tell me a, a little bit about where you're from, and uh, I know you're married, and it's it five children you have? Yeah, going on five, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Um, and you're traveling the world, you've been in over 30 odd countries and... Uh, About 50. Yeah, 50 yeah. now, wow, okay, that's quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> so God's using you around the world to uh, talk about grace and talk about the goodness of God and set people free, but he had to do that work in you first of all. That's right. Yeah. So, so Rob, tell us uh, a little bit about where you grew up and life at home. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's super exciting. Um, I I was born in New Jersey. That's a little secret I don't share with a lot of people. Uh, raised in Florida, uh, near the beach, you know, and uh, I was raised in a Seventh Day Adventist uh, household. If you're familiar with that, and um, and so my dad was uh, he owned a, a masonry business, like construction blocks, brick, um, and uh, but he was also a lay pastor for a time at the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and so uh, we we were. Uh, very strict, very very strict. You know, um, uh, Jewish Sabbaths, not eating certain yeah, foods, keeping sure. the Sabbath. You know, it's very strict. And so, we were super uh, indoctrinated with as far as the law and uh, what you know what to do and not to do in order for God to accept you, kind of thing. And um, you know, I always uh, I always had a lot of questions for my parents. And uh, one of the questions was if Jesus was so friendly in the Gospels, then why why was his father so mean and scary before the Gospels, you know, course, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and we would read stories about Jesus healing people, but, you know, we didn't, we didn't have any grid for the Holy Spirit, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, anything like that. Um, and so, I, again, I would ask a lot of questions, and those questions would go kind of unanswered. And uh, when I turned about 10 years old, um, we kind of found out that my dad was uh, sneaking around doing doing his own thing, and um, you know he. So him and my mother got this horrible, nasty divorce, and you know left me in shambles. And uh, and I praise God that our relationships restored today. God's done an amazing work in that. But you know, it left at the time it left me in shambles, and uh, um, you know I ended up with in the psychiatrist's office, and I ended up attempting suicide, and I ended up I mean just almost everything you could imagine, just from that pain, that rejection, and that pain of you know my dad was like my hero, now he's gone, and so any view I had of my dad dad the safety the protector you know I, I i was trying to have that view of god as well and it just all went out the window did you blame yourself for him leaving yes the first thing that happened um was i experienced you know rage and anger that i just didn't even know existed to that capacity you know when you experience something like that uh you don't know what to do with it you don't know how to process it mm. and so uh when i was experiencing that my first thought was 
this must be my fault somehow and if I was never born uh, everything would probably be okay this probably would not have been happening and so my and I and what's really interesting is I remembered a scripture that my parents had taught me over and over as a kid in Leviticus it says the life is in the blood yes. and I was thinking that well if I can get my blood to come out then I have no life and everything will be okay I've never heard of suicide but it, that's how it progressed and so I began the suicide attempts uh, anytime I got a loan I would think about how I could make it as if I was never born and then may, everything would be okay you know and so the first accusation yeah really was against myself and then as I turned 13 14 it turned toward God I was angry at God yes and, and growing up in a, a home that was legalistic um, but full of double standards you know which is actually really yeah. common it is but, unfortunately <laughs> but it shapes young people's minds doesn't it and you know. it, it, it absolutely does because because uh, whether we realize it or not it indoctrinates us uh, as far as we have a worldview we have a paradigm of the knowledge of good versus evil rather than knowing God and his yes. goodness and anything that doesn't line up with that is false but it's you know act this way but then if you're going to church make sure you act this way there's yes. a good bad you yeah. know black white and and uh, and that's all I knew so uh, so uh, you slipped into depression oppression and all these other things but how did you get into witchcraft how did you get into Satan worship yeah so uh, I was raised in a private Seventh-day Adventist school uh, we had these wretched uniforms that I couldn't stand and uh, you know I, I wanted to just you know look like the other kids on my block but I wasn't really even allowed to, to, to play with them much or talk to them because of their possible influence you know their devilish influence over me or whatever and uh, and so once my dad left uh, my mom she had lost her faith and so she began going to bars and things like that and I didn't even know what that was and so I thought well if she's doing her thing then maybe I can do my thing and actually have some friends in my life and dress like all the other kids you know mm -hmm. with our Jinko jeans or whatever we used to wear you know in the early 90s and uh, and so I began to go to public school and that you know I went literally went from a class of like you know 12 kids with a graduating class of four to this school that had over 3,000 students in it and I didn't even know what alcohol was I didn't know what drugs were I didn't know what gangs were like I'd never heard of any of this stuff in my life and um, and so my first day of school my life was threatened I got chased with guns in, in Florida there was gang activity everywhere um, I got called all these, you know, humiliating names and um and I had already been struggling with hating myself and trying to figure out who am I, what is my identity. Uh my dad leaving kind of left this void in me feeling like I needed to be protected. So I was questioning everything. I was questioning should I was I should I have been born a female? You know, like every question I can have, I'm having these questions. Uh and I'm just consistently getting beat up and I couldn't find any friends that would actually accept me except for this one guy who was like also a nerd and everyone didn't like him and he loved the Backstreet Boys and just played video games all day kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So like the only friend I could find and I'm like, you know, I want to find a a family. I was looking for a family really like someone that I can plug in and that they'll just teach me their ways so I know how to like find myself, you know. And I found that in a group of Satanists. Uh, after about six months of going to the school, um, you know, I, I had already been, like I said, uh, attempting suicide at home. I'd been um, just uh, experimenting with different things. I'd been, you know, trying to figure out how do I express all of this darkness that I feel inside, the hatred, the anger. And one day, and this is how it hooked me, I saw this person, couldn't tell whether they were male or female, you know, just walking down the hallway tons of makeup on the like war paint looking evil raccoon looking makeup on their face long black hair long black nails and the symbol around their neck and as they walk down the hallway I just I'm like everything all of the uh, essence of that person is what I feel inside the darkness the hatred the anger the rage the malice and so I went over and just I said what well, you know it's not Halloween what are you why are you dressed like that you know I'm like really curious and they said, oh, well, you know, we're the, we're the, they, they called themselves the freaks. We're the freaks. Everyone hates us. We're obsessed with death and darkness. And, uh, and immediately I was just like, 
well, I'm obsessed with death and darkness. That's all I think about. And so, can I hang out with you? And they said, sure. And I was shocked because they didn't beat me up. They were like, yeah, come hang out with us, you know. So, I wanted to be more like them. Uh, they gave me a satanic Bible that same day. They said, you know, memorize all of these things. I was 12. I went home. I, um, you know, <laughs> I put my, my little kid's Bible next to my the satanic Bible. And, I, and I, I believed in the spirit realm. And I just, I put one hand on each and I said, spirits, whatever spirits exist, whoever you are, whatever is real, show me where the real power is because I want to feel powerful. I'm tired of this victim life. I'm tired of feeling like I should just die. I want to feel powerful. And um, I began reading in the, you know, the satanic statements in the satanic Bible. And I think the thing that really stuck out to me was um, that the, the essence of Satanism is that you are your own God. It's not that you're actually worshiping Lucifer, but it's that you are your own God. And so it's in a way it, it seeks to empower you as God. It's like the spirit of Satan. It's, Satan said, I will ascend above. Exactly. It's, um, um, yeah, exactly. it's a glorified humanism. It's yeah. exactly in that vein, yeah. and it, and it, but it, it makes you feel empowered, like you're not a victim anymore, and and at the expense of others, you can be powerful and have what what you desire, you know. And so I memorized those statements, uh, went through my mom's makeup drawer, thinking she'll have some black lipstick or something. She you know she didn't have any of that. She had like yellow eyeshadow and. And, and, and like brown lip pencil, you know, and I just I shaved my eyebrows off and I put all this makeup on my face and I put these big yellow circles around my eyes just thinking I'm going to be cool, you know. And I go to school the next day and I said, hey guys, I memorized all the satanic statements uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, they're just looking at my face and they're just like what did you do go through your mother's makeup drawer or something, you know. And I'm like, is it that obvious? And so... You know, from that day, uh, they 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 helped me start this journey of expressing the anger and the death that I felt inside on my face and on my nails, and like so, I got into this cross dressing thing, and I begin to you know experiment with different lifestyles and uh, just just looking for that fulfillment. You know, yeah, you were, you had a hole in your heart and you wanted to fill it with, with you were looking for love and acceptance, and they gave yeah. you that. Yeah, how did your family react to this kind of? Uh, changing you um so you know my dad was nowhere in the picture and my 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 mother i don't think she understood the severity of what i was getting into because she was kind of kind of for a while she was working hard and then she was just going out and trying to enjoy her life and do her thing so i was home alone a lot for some of those years and um it wasn't until a few years later that i think she realized the extent of what what was going on uh but i was sleeping over friends houses all the time and and again when i was 12 i was sleeping over the the nerd's house his name was michael sleeping over his house and uh he had fallen asleep and he had an older brother who had just gotten out of jail and uh him and his friends came over and uh they you know found me dragged me out of the room locked me in their room and Horrible stuff. I mean, shoved alcohol down my throat. I didn't even know what it was. It forced me to drink stuff, sm you know, snort stuff, smoke stuff, uh, other horrible wow. things. And then I wake up the next morning and now I'm just angrier than I've ever been. I feel violated. I'm hurt. You know, how could these people do this to me? And, um, I tried to tell my friend he didn't even believe me and I said well listen they gave me some liquid that like burned like fire going down but it made me pass out and I think I want more of it because I hate my life right now and you know it, it's it'll help black me out take me away from whatever I'm feeling and he's like oh dude my parents are alcoholics yeah we can get you that so he gives me a bottle of 180 proof liquor and I'm 12 wow. years old. I was just turning 13 Wow. So he gives me a bottle of 180 proof liquor. I take it home within a week or two. It's it's gone. I guzzled the whole thing. So now I need more. And so you know I'm sitting outside the liquor store, 13 years old, two o'clock in the morning. I'm waving a twenty dollar bill. Hey, somebody help buy buy me something. And people would do it. They say, "How old are you?" 13. They'd say, "What do you want?" And they'd get me a vodka or whatever, you know. And so, so this was now my kind of new escape. And I really became an alcohol. By 14, I was full blown alcoholic, morning, noon, and night. Stopped going to school. Uh, ended up meeting a witch, uh, you know, introduced to me by the Satanists because I told them, you know, I, I want to go deeper. I want to like, is there power I can tap into? I want spiritual power. I told mm -hmm. them. So they introduced me to this girl who was kind of a, had a family of different uh, levels. 
of witchcraft, Wiccan, and then some other things. And uh, and so she became you know became my girlfriend. I moved in with her at 14. So I think that's part of the reason that wow. my mother wasn't so aware of what was going on because I left the house you know at 14. And um, once she taught me everything she knew, palm reading, astrology, um, we would we would meet in the graveyards two o'clock in the morning, and people would always make fun of us. You know, people would say, "Oh, look at the witches, the warlocks." Ooh. And so we'd challenge them, and we'd say, "You want to make fun of us? Come to our coven in such and such graveyard at two o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. and then make fun of us." And and some of them would show up, and the ones that would show up would convert almost instantly because they would be freaked out. They would see something, they would feel something, because it was real. I mean, mm-hmm. demonic stuff, the spirit realm is real. It's very real. And you learn how to manipulate energies, pretty much anyone can do that if you want to open that door, mm-hmm. and they would be freaked out. And so, you know, <laughs> then they would they would have to come to terms with, okay, this is real, so do I join them or do I keep running? Because now I'm scared, what do I do? And we loved that feeling of having that power over people, like, ah, you know. And um, but it it didn't last that long. Um, I ended up getting into some heavier drugs. Um, I was in some horrible relationships, and then uh, at 16, this witch girlfriend uh, left me, took the shirt off my back, you know, took my belongings, and I found myself in the same place as 12. And here I am wanting to commit suicide again. Uh, most of my friends from the satanic sect in the high school had been either uh, died or been had a drug bust or went to jail for a bomb threat or just something like that. All of them are just gone. So it's like me and this one other guy left, you know. Yeah. And um, and so from that, uh, I'm trying to think, from that point, um, I moved back in. With, I called my mom and I'm like, you know, you think I could come home? And she's like, of course. And I didn't know that she was kind of going through this uh, trying to find God again type thing, you know, Mm -hmm. so if I'd have known that, I would not have moved back home because I was very angry. I hated, you know, I hated the name of Jesus. I didn't want to hear anything about any of that. And um, so that night after our coven, you know, me and my friends, it was late, I got home and uh, had had some things with me and uh had you know really so just some spell hand spell books handbooks witches handbooks um uh some pornography tapes maybe uh a satanic altar with like some candles you know this is pretty much my belongings wow. and uh i'm going to you know go back into the house and when i open the door my mother's there on her knees crying with a bible in her hand and i I I was you know it caught me by surprise and uh she looks at me and she says Robbie you know she called me Robbie right and uh she says I I think I realized the, the depth of darkness that you're in you've you've got to you've got to at least try with me to come back to God and as soon as she said that I I lost it I I because I was so possessed by devils I mean I I was I, I felt this kind of bubbling feeling you know inside like I couldn't control what was going to come out of my mouth my mouth opens and I looked at my mom and I remember I, it's like I couldn't even stop I, it's just these words are coming out of my mouth and I said woman don't say anything about God in front of me like don't you know and then she tried to say the name Jesus and I, I oh I freaked out and I had to it's kind of like I had to force myself to turn around and run out of the house and I'm sitting in my car and now I'm I'm tearing up I'm trying not to because I'm like I don't want to hurt my own mother I, my life's out of control. I should have died a long time ago. Why am I still alive? You know, all these questions. And it was the first time that I actually thought about asking God if he was real. But I didn't want to do it in case he was. I was <laughs> like, ah. Yeah. Did you think you'd gone too far? Yeah. And this is what I said. I, so instead of saying, well, are you real? I, I said this out loud. I said, okay, God, if God, if there's a God... I know that I've gone too far and that you couldn't bring me in anyway, even if you wanted to. So I was, so the, the lie that I, the, the number one lie that I believe was that if God was real, there's no way he would be able to forgive me or love me anyway. Mm-hmm. So my, my thought process was why bother? So if I'm going to hell, I'm going to just take as many people with me as I can. God's never going to love me anyway. Kind of, you know, so that was my thought process. And, uh, went back inside and you know me and my mother tried to have a conversation it was pretty heated and she said you know I'm just tired of going to the bars I'm tired of this I'm tired of that I want to find peace in my life again and I don't think 
the way that we grew up under the law. I don't think that offered us the peace that I'm looking for. So I kind of liked what she was saying, but I didn't. You know what I mean? Because, uh, and, and then she starts telling me of some of her adventures in the in the Bible and realizing that maybe some of the things we believed growing up uh, was a little bit too far. So I kind of agreed with her in that sense, but I just didn't want to talk about it. I was like, sure. just ah, just stop, you know. Um, and that was when everything really reached uh, reached ahead. I would say um, I had recently. You know, been hanging out with these people that believe they were vampires and werewolves. They actually believed that. They, they lived like that. They drank blood. They stayed up all night as rit- ritualistically, you know what I yeah. mean? And um, I would I had recently been introduced to a, uh, a Luciferian type of devil worshiper who believed that sacrifices were necessary, you know. And so I, I was going that direction. Mm. when all of this began to come to a head. Um, growing up vegetarian, I, I could never quite... <laughs> I was still kind of having trouble with the... Try to lighten it up, right? I was still kind of having trouble with the sacrifice thing. Um, but when they introduced me to someone who had actually sacrificed their own newborn baby to Lucifer, I that was tough. And I was like, okay... I don't know how much of this I can take, but if it's going to give me power, I got to at least try it. That was my thought process. So it's just kind of getting into that. Um, I had had a couple near death experiences that added to the mix um, where I should have been dead, but I wasn't, and I couldn't figure out like, why am I not dead, you know? Um, and it all came to a head when I got a crazy idea. Which was? <laughs> the crazy idea uh, was June 2001. And I'd heard about this big Christian music festival going on a couple hours away. And um, I, I, I wanted to brand myself as the Satan evangelist, the one who turned Christians to Satan. Like, that was, that was what I wanted to do. And so um, this idea hit me, like, this is the perfect opportunity for you to do this, you know. And I'm thinking it's like Master Devil talking to me yeah. here. And, that, and then years later, I realized... Maybe that was actually God scandalizing me into getting me to that place so that he could, you know, have something up his sleeve. And uh, But anyway, so I, I called up a couple of my buddies and I said, hey, would you guys want to go to this Christian music festival and bring tons of satanic material, you know, paraphernalia, you know, and see how many Christians we can convert to Satan? And they were like, yeah, sounds great. Let's do it. You know, so we had drugs. I mean, we brought everything. And um, it was at that festival um, that uh, uh, the first thing was um, it wasn't going as smoothly as I thought it would. You know, we we're like getting no conversions. <laughs> <Surely not. laughs> and I'm like, what's the deal? You know, yeah. And so uh, they had a few different stages. And one of the stages was like a more alternative stage. And that offended me because they had these supposedly these Christian rock and metal bands. And I'm like how dare you like that's our music you can't do that and so see for me growing up drums were of the devil you know electric guitars all this stuff was of the devil had a lot of power so here i am you know at this alternative stage and this band gets up there they're covered in tattoos and they're like they're like doves and fire like i've never seen anything so all that indoctrination from from my childhood immediately hits and i'm just like how dare they god can't love them like that they can't they can't have tattoos and call themselves christian so all this pharisees just coming out of me you know and uh so i i stayed in in line in the hot sun for two hours to talk to meet the guitarist who happened to also be the drummer of evanescence and uh and so I, I, I get him face to face and I he's a big guy too and I, and, I, and I challenge him and I'm like hey you know you're you're an incredible musician I respect that but I have a serious problem with you trying to take that music and use it for God I'm like how can you do that I said I'm a devil worshiper and that's that's our music you can't and uh, you know so I'm expecting him to do what all the other Christians did when I said I'm a devil worshiper and it would always kind of be like this you know you see a horror movie with the vampire they they grab the crucifix and they're you know the holy water so I expected him to kind of go that route and he didn't he uh he starts preaching at me and he and he shares with me his whole testimony of how Jesus delivered him from witchcraft drug addiction suicide satanism so he's basically telling me my life story and I was floored you remember the genie on Aladdin? Like his jaw drops and hits the floor. It was like that. I was so floored. And I didn't know how to process it. And so for the next three nights, uh, till, till the last night of the festival, I couldn't even sleep. I just tossed and turned. And all 
all I thought was like, what if everything this guy said is true? What do I do? Mm-hmm. How do I change? How do I even believe that? I don't know how to make it happen, you know? And uh, so the last night, uh, we'd given out all of our books, all of our t- tracts, right? We were, I was tired. I was, I was burned out. We didn't really see but a couple people that were interested. Um, I wasn't even wearing my pentagram anymore. I always wore the pentagram around my neck, and I was just like, ah, I'm tired. And so my friend said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, there's one last, you know, worship concert. Let's go down and mock all the worshipers the whole time. I didn't know what else to do. I was just tired, you know. And uh, so we get, so we butt our way down front center. It's like Newsboys, and like Audio Adrenaline, DC Talk, and all these guys. They got like spinning drum sets. And I, I never knew that Christians could put on such a good show, you know. I'm just like, and... um So we start mocking these people that are worshiping. And I had never seen people raise their hands before. I was taught that's irreverent growing up. You don't you don't do that. You don't clap, you don't dance, you don't shake, you don't nothing like that. You know, it's very irreverent and demonic. And I was also told if you ever hear people speaking in tongues, they're they're full of demons. Run as fast as you can. And so here I am and you know, there's this moment of silence and the, the guy is like, you know, if you don't know Jesus tonight tonight's your night and I'm just like oh yeah if you don't you know and I'm just making fun of him and all of a sudden man something just shut me up I, I felt this somber uh, heaviness come over me and uh, the night that I almost died came right back to my memory and I remember I said something along the lines of oh God if you're real don't let me die and I'll serve you forever kind of mockingly you know and, and all this just begins to hit my memory and it comes to the point where I just can't take it anymore. I feel like I'm boiling over, I'm a boiling pot, and I'm just done. I'm, I'm overflowing, and I have to know what I have to know what the truth is. And I just came to that point. So I screamed out at the top of my lungs, God, if you're so great, if you're so good, then where are you? You know, why'd you let my dad leave? Why'd you let my life fall apart? Why are you such a phony? You know, and I'm just un- unleashing all my anger on God. The Bible says you're good. You're not good. You know, if you were, then you'd this and that, you know. And um, people are looking at me. I said, but you know what? Here I am. If you're so big, then why don't you you come? Why don't you strike me dead? Why don't you do something? You know, I'm just angry, you know. And uh, uh, the next thing I knew, I I opened my eyes and my face was face down in the dirt on the ground. And my first thought was, God is real. My second thought was, and I'm dead. And I deserve it. He's going to kill me right now. He's going to strike me with a lightning bolt. And I should, and I totally deserve this right now. Uh, but suddenly it was like, uh, it was like a river. It kind of, from the inside, it felt like a river began to flow through me and out of me. It felt like waves. So I thought I was dying. I thought, okay, I'm going to like come out of my body any minute, you know, and, and see the flames of hell. You know, I'm just thinking, what am I, what's going to happen to me? But, but my, as I felt this peace, it was like peace that came over me. And, I, and um, the only way I can describe it is like I felt like I was just floating in this ocean or like this river was coming out of me. And I saw a vision and it wasn't a vision, um, you know, the big, a big moving vision. It was just everything went white. And if I looked all around, everything was white, and I just saw this sentence written in front of me. That was it. And it said, everything you've been through will now be turned around and used for my glory. That's what it, I don't even know what that meant. Cool. And so I came out of it, and I feel this bubbling feeling, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, I'm going to throw up a bunch of demons or something weird is going to happen, you know. And my mouth opens, and the name of Jesus, just like a bullet, I just scream at the top of my lungs, Jesus! You know, and, and I'm just being rocked. My body's shaking. I'm feeling tingles everywhere. You know, I had no drugs that day. Like, no, there's nothing to explain what's happening right now. And um, I heard a little whisper, I've forgiven you. And, I, and it was before I even really asked for forgiveness. You know, and Jesus even did that in the scripture. And so everything I thought about God, he completely... Um, blew that out of the water in two seconds. It was done. And when I when I was done, I'm, I'm on my knees. I'm shaking. And I looked up at my friend because he's standing next to me. And he just had this bewildered look on his face like, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Get up. Stop. And I couldn't. I, I tried to get up. 
and I just I could barely stand I felt like jelly I was just like oh and uh, he said what happened to you and I looked at him and I <laughs> I must have looked like a lunatic I just said I think I just met Jesus man I don't know but now I could say the name Jesus and I could never yeah. say it before and he's like what are you talking about you come in here like hey, and you fall in the dirt and you flop around and you scream and then you say you met Jesus like are you crazy you know and I'm like I don't care what you think I'm gonna go tell the youth group so I ran I, I could hardly run I'm, I'm, I'm like Ugh, you know I get back to the campsite where all the youth are sitting around the campfire and uh, they're, they're, they're literally toasting marshmallows and you know they got the acoustic guitar and I come my clothes I mean I had fishnets on my arms like the gothic fishnet mm. they're half ripped off I got makeup all smeared down my face from crying so much much. And I come jumping out of the bushes like that, like a bat out of hell. And the, the youth group sitting around the fire, and I scream, "Guys, I just met Jesus!" And everybody's ducking because they think I'm going to pull out a gun and shoot them or something. They're all scared of me, you know. And uh, it was, you know, it was crazy. And I spent the next like three weeks. I didn't even have my license yet. I spent my next three weeks riding my bike to every leader of the satanic sect, you know, that I was a part of, to all of their houses preaching Jesus to them and they were all threatening to kill me and I, I didn't care I was like you know I had a I had a secular girlfriend at the time who saw such a change in me and one time we were uh, I don't remember what it was but she saw something supernatural and it freaked her out so bad she was like I know your God is real and I'm more scared than I've ever been in my life right now. Like, we just see these crazy... And she broke up with me. And I was kind of praying for that because I didn't want a girl that didn't know God like I knew God. You know, like, that's just kind of... Um, and uh, the rest was history. You know, I just... I, I couldn't get enough of telling people what Jesus had done for me. And uh, I never knew it was going to lead me into, you know, full-time ministry and evangelism around the world or anything like that. I just... I just wanted to let people know that, you know, freedom is real. It's, it's in Jesus. And Jesus is real. Amen. Amen. So, if you have any advice to give the viewer, maybe they're struggling, maybe they're in a similar situation, what would you tell the young guy, the young woman that's, you know, dabbling, playing with the occult? Uh, and then, what would you say to the older more mature guy that's already deep into the occult yeah that's good um i would say <laughs> i would say that um oh my gosh god's so crazy about you <laughs> um i would say what he did for me he will definitely do for you and beyond that though i think we're all born with kind of an innate with kind of a natural desire um for great things, for supernatural things, to delve into depths and into mysteries. And there's not anything wrong with that. But here's where I want to take it. You are engineered to know Him intimately. And the Holy Spirit is crazy, crazy more awesome than you've probably ever imagined. And, and I'll tell you something. When I was in the occult, you know, I experienced, I mean, we did table tapping, we did Ouija boards, we did conjuring up, the, every possible thing you could imagine. And we experienced powerful spiritual encounters. But when I met Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, it topped by a million and beyond any demonic or occultic encounter I ever had with the spirit world um, and and that's the God's honest truth I I don't get paid to say things like this I don't waste my life trying to make people believe a certain way but it had such a profound impact on me and I'm telling you right now um, everything that you were ever created for <laughs> will be realized when you meet Jesus and begin a relationship with him it is it's crazy it's incredible and to those that have been you know in it longer and and you're kind of deeper or up those you know further levels however you want to say it um, I would say you're not too deep for Jesus uh, there's a depth within Jesus Christ. You know, Paul says in the scripture that he hopes and prays that we would come to know the height and the depth, the breadth, the width of his love. And uh, you think you might be deep in darkness right now or deep in the occult, or you think you might feel powerful now? Uh, try surrendering to Jesus because there is a depth that is so much greater than anything the counterfeit, the occult, and any of that has to offer. Um, and and it's not one of these happy-go-lucky, everything will just be fine forever. Are you kidding me? We, we have opposition and resistance 
all the time. But if you're in the occult, that should actually challenge you. That should actually make you excited. And so if you want to see real opposition and real resistance and be a real rebel in the world system, try surrendering to Jesus. I'm telling you, you're going to experience a depth you've never experienced before. And because it's what you were created for. You were created to know Him and the power of His resurrection. And it's not just some way to believe. It's literally, like Peter says, we get to not just be observers, but participators. God wants to share His divinity, His divine life with us and empower you for everything. It's not about fulfilling your own desires, but it's like when you start relationship with Him, it's like, it's like His heart becomes your heart. And, you, and it's the only way to be fulfilled like you're created to be fulfilled. Amen. Amen. So... We want you to respond to what Rob said today. We want you to contact us and say, you know, I'm, I'm reaching out. I need Jesus. Uh, and we want to contact with you and we want to pray with you and we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. Uh, so we're asking right now that you'd step out in faith and contact us and tell us that you're seeking Jesus and we'll help you. And if, you're, if you don't know how to respond, here's a, here's a real good way to start. Say, Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to me. Just start like that. Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to me. And we've seen this in the streets, but even with atheists, agnostics, mm-hmm. just because they're angry. And I say, well, just ask the Holy Spirit. And they'll, they'll come back 10 minutes later. Oh my gosh, pray with me, please. Because mm-hmm. I did what you said, you know. And so ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to you and in you. That's His job. Mm-hmm. And then respond accordingly. Yeah. And in case you don't know, the Holy Spirit is God. Um, when Jesus went back to heaven, He sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is what uh, is is making the church possible today, making people like you and me and yeah. Rob believe in Jesus, helping us to understand the Word of God, helping us to um, to just know Jesus. He's basically like Jesus without skin. <laughs> he, he's the one that's the, he's your connection point. Um, so yeah. yeah. Okay, Rob. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to the next time you're with Amen. us. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Bye bye now.